All set? Yeah. Pursuant to section 20 of chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 as amended, several court council members, including uh, Nat Lowell, Mark Reese, and Rob Mercy, Rob Mercy are participating remotely today. Because of their physical uh, attendance today would be unreasonably difficult. All court council members in attendance and all members participating in the meeting by the Zoom video conferencing app will be clearly audible to each other. As a result, members' remote participation in this meeting and any and all votes taken by the members today shall be by roll call vote. I would also like to inform everyone that Sean Driscoll, the authority's communication director, is making an audio and video recording of today's meeting. Is there anyone else making an audio recording of today's meeting? If so, please identify yourself. Louisa? Louisa Hofstadter with the Vineyard Gazette. Thank you. Unki? Unki Sanu from the Yummy Times. Thank you. Uh, that's what I say, just those two. Okay, thank you. If you are joining virtually, please press the raise your hand icon on the Zoom dashboard, or if you are joining by phone, please press uh, star nine on your keyboard, on your keypad, excuse me. When you are recognized, please state your name uh, for the record. Thank you. Uh, before the meeting starts, I'd just like to recognize that we have another uh, member of the Vineyard community here today, uh, Christina Colaruso, who's a selectman from the town of Tisbury. Thank you for coming over. Now call the meeting to order. <clears throat> uh, minutes of the meeting. Motion. So moved. To approve. I'll second. <clears throat> Matt Lowell. Aye. John Cahill. Cahill, aye. Mark Reese. Abstain. Uh, Rob Murnia. Aye. Joe Salito, aye. Management reports, updates on the current projects, including one, the uh, website uh, update, redesign, please. All right, um, I'll start. And we have um, Stephen Coleman and Kirk Van Riper here as well to uh, to assist. So um, the um, stellar elements in the Steamships uh, technology team have been uh, continuing to work on the website uh, in an internal beta. Uh, site launch has been uh, has been done. Um, we're, they're reviewing internal security scans or completed that. Uh, they're working on some of the fixing some of the front end bugs, and uh, the mobile app uh, has been submitted to uh, Apple and Google. I don't uh, as of yesterday we haven't gotten word back on those being approved yet. Uh, so internal testing is uh, continuing on the uh, on the bugs. Um, so Sean put up the slide here. Um, the developers, uh, meanwhile, uh, looking at uh, resolving some uh, outstanding issues. There's a issue with uh, changing vehicles on a reservation. Um, there were, that's on the list. Um, booking high-speed reservations as a guest. Um, the ability to pay for a balance due and the ability to cancel an excursion reservation. Um, so they continue to work on on those on those issues and retesting them. Um, they're also looking at setting up a, a process in which they can uh, be reviewing uh, reviewing the site to make sure that uh, everything is operating uh, properly. Um, a load test, so that way we we have a sense as to what the uh, uh, what the stress level of the of the system is. And uh, there's also some credit card processing you know, for some live credit card data uh, that's going on. In the meantime, um, there's been some uh, public uh, sessions that Sean has been conducting. He was over on the vineyard uh, yesterday and he's heading to Nantucket today, I believe. Is that the schedule, Sean? Correct. We had uh, two sessions on the vineyard yesterday, one on Nantucket this afternoon, and then the second one on Nantucket Thursday evening. Uh, and um, it's helpful to have these sessions. I understand one of the issues that came up yesterday was uh, people were able to um, make a reservation and once they put it into the shopping cart, um, it would um, clear the shopping cart because uh, there was an issue recognizing the time change um, for daylight savings time. So um, it was a good it was a good thing because it only happens you know twice a year or once a year in this case that it would have timed out. so, 
Uh, that was um, you know a, a good catch uh, by the team to be able to get that get that resolved. So, um, so as, as Sean said, there's still some uh, public information sessions that we have. Um, we had talked with IMOC, our current website vendor, uh, and they're um, you know willing to uh, be retained through March as a backup. So as we as we move forward, um, we're looking at the after Thanksgiving as the, the live rollout for um, for our users. And but again, if we have any issue, we have the IMOC site to to fall back on. So. Um, with that, I don't know whether Stephen or Kurt have anything to add, or if you have any questions, we have it to answer. Oh, uh, we did want to show a couple. A couple I'm sorry, a couple of screenshots of what we have, and uh, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the front is the top left is the you know, first uh, the home page. Uh, there's an image of what the you know when you go into a reservation. And also a status update on the on the on the bottom. So, if anyone has any questions, any questions? No. Thank you. So we we we, we remain at just about ninety six percent of the of the budget uh, has been, but there's been no no change orders. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, the IT review. Okay. Uh, again. Um, Stephen and Kurt, if they uh, have anything. Uh, so uh, you got the uh, presentation in, Sean? Sorry, one second. Too many technological. And, all right, technology has this been. There we go. All right. So uh, again, this was something that um, back in the back in the spring um, was to uh, provide a comprehensive assessment of our uh, our current systems and to develop a uh, um, pathway for improvements in uh, in the implementation schedule. Um, so next. So. Uh, Kickoff of the activities really started back in, in June. So there was data request and interviews and, and the like that's all been completed. Next, in July, they started benchmarking us against other, uh, you know, other industries. Uh, they determined they started having some, uh, a survey was developed. They talked with uh, um, Stellar Elements as well as uh, what's what they're doing for the new website. Next. Um, then in August, they launched a survey. Uh, they had stakeholder interviews, uh, visioning statement. Next. So uh, right now, they, they've been looking at options, uh, what options we have, uh, refining those in some working sessions, um, and it's, uh, assess what those options are, um, the, uh, and also to start to determine what the costs, costs will be for those various options. Um, they also, uh, the big thing here has been uh, reviewing uh, cloud-based alternatives to our reservation system. And um, so uh, right now uh, they had gone through, they had identified a number of different reservation systems that are out there. Um, we're scheduling some um, sessions with, with those providers on, on determining what they, what their systems offer and what they don't, uh, and uh, we'll be doing that over the over the coming a couple of weeks here. Um, with the uh, the idea being is that as we as we move forward on this, that we'd be looking at uh, a recommendation in terms of what path we feel is necessary. If we're going to be going out for a new system, um, this is uh, helpful. This would, these sessions will be helpful to to start to determine the scope of work that we'd be looking for. Uh, what we need from a new reservation system if we're going if we go end up going that route um, you know what's the advantages of uh, be able to have a criteria in which to evaluate um, uh, any proposals at a, at a future time so um, and next 
So uh, the goal here is to end up coming up with a draft report here in December and a final report at the, uh, in time for the January meetings um, on on what they um, you know what a recommended path uh, will be. Um, some of this includes, um, you know, again, the, the focus at this point right now has been on the reservation system, but it's also uh, been identifying um, some of the other needs that we have in, internally in terms of, um, you know, security protocols and things like that, that, um, you know, we always ha have to stay on top of. So um, I think you know, it's be a fairly comprehensive uh, uh, look at all that. So, and next so it was a uh, contract was two hundred forty five thousand. We spent one hundred forty thousand. So um, about fifty seven percent of the of the budget has been uh, done at this point. So, mm -hmm. so with that, if I have any questions, uh, Kurt or Steve will be happy to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah please, sure. Um, can you guys get into who are the cut, uh, companies you're looking at that are the outside vendors for reservation system? Yeah, so some of them. Um, some of the companies um, we got Rocket Res, uh, okay. we got uh, Karis. Um, I don't know whether they go by Bucket or by Hogier, but yeah. um, they're another one. Um, I'm trying to think, there's, there's eight or nine of them on the list right now. Perry Hawk, Perry Hawk, yeah, Ferry Hawk, and yeah. So, um, and there's going to be advantages and disadvantages to each one yeah. um, in terms of, um, you know. Do we end up being a, a small fish in a big pond or are we a big fish in a small pond yeah. type thing to, in terms of develop, uh, driving development yeah. on, on, the, on for our needs? So, uh, the Hogia, is there, are they now part of someone else? They merged with um, another company. Um, I think they go by Book It is the, uh, is the program that they use. I forget offhand what's the name of that. Okay. Because I looked for them the other day, a month ago, and I couldn't find them, so they probably just got sucked up by somebody. Yeah, they merged. They merged with someone, but they they still. I think their website still Functional. refers to Hogia in some aspects. Okay. Okay. So, well, are there other are there other steamboat companies that use some of these uh, vendors? Yeah. That, we could yeah. speak, that we could speak to and say, how does it work? Are they good? Are they bad? Yeah, so some of them, you know, like for instance, Washington State, they only have reservations on one of their routes. That's the only, everything else is a first come, first serve. Because their vessels are so large that they, they don't have a they don't have an issue. Um, and then some of the other ones, um, they're smaller. And, and quite frankly, some of these systems that are out there are more geared towards Passenger only service. So it's like an airline, a seat is a seat is a seat. Yeah. So to be able to find a company that can do both, do both and um, obviously, yeah. you know, the, the biggest issue we have is on, on the vehicle side. Um, you know, we have a point of sale for for passenger tickets. We have a, a mobile, yeah. you know, the ability to buy tickets on a mobile app and, and scan it. And I mean, one of the things that we have uh, right now for our, um, our mobile ticketing is uh, NFC ability. So we're the only ferry operator in the in the US that has that NFC uh, system. And um, what is it? It just, uh, the volume for other operators isn't there for them to, for, for those to, to be putting in place. So. Could that be incorporated with something that somebody else might have? It's something that we'd want to maintain as, as part of our system. Yeah. So we're getting on this pilot program in a proof of concept, and that's how we're able to do that. We're mm -hmm. working with one of the vendors. Any yeah. questions? Uh, yes, Rob. Yeah, thanks. Uh, interesting. Um, as we've learned from the website project, once you go into implementation on these kind of things, they're tricky. I'm wondering how much uh, in the report they're going to talk about things like implementation, like what the budget might be, the time frames, because uh, these are obviously pretty large undertakings once a decision is made. And I'm wondering if that's part of what they're going to be uh, providing an assessment for. Yeah, so uh, that will be part of their, their assessment um, in terms of, um, you know, each strategy, what they see in terms of, um, you know, time, resources, um, uh, estimated budgets, things, things of that nature. 
Um, so that, that's all going to be part, part of it. And there may be some interim steps that need to be taken to, you know, before you get to, to C, you have to go through B as, as, a, as an option. So, um, you know, those are, these are all going to be uh, um, mapped out and uh, you know, hopefully come back with a, um, you know, uh, a path uh, to be able to go forward to improve our services to our customers as well as to, um, you know, facilitate, you know, keeping uh, our operations as efficient as possible. Do you, do you and, sort of sense this is, is this a, a two-year project? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, and a lot of this is going to end up being is the, the timing of it because um, obviously we, we want to have it, you're going to have to, if we're switching systems, you're going to want to be doing at a time that um, is least disruptive. Um, to uh, the system, so you're not going to want to be rolling it out in a, in a you know right before summer uh, type thing. So it'd probably be a late fall, um, winter. Um, just the development of the RFP package and um, the um, the advertisements and evaluations and all that. That's going to take you know you know upwards of six seven months um, you know to to be able to do so. Um, and then I, I think their their um, Gibbous has uh, been realistic. They they anticipate that this would be a you know a multi year process in um, you know again you know whichever route we go um, to do it. So yeah, no, again, I think it's realism is important. I got I guess two words from me: project management. Yeah, yeah, and uh, to be able to have this type of a uh, um, you know. Uh, a needs needs list at the beginning, so that way we, we have no uh, surprises uh, going forward. So, but a lot of it's going to be regardless is you know the the resources that we have internally to be able to support any system. Uh, that's something that they're looking at as well. So, um, you know, it's a tough labor market out there to to be hiring very competitive at the moment. So, uh, we'll have to see how that goes. Yeah. Well, thanks. Important project. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Bob. Uh, going to the uh, MV Corner and MV Bossable status. So I'll have Mark come up and he can walk us through. The... Nice to see you in person. I know, Mark. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> oh, the alligator. They're, they're still there. The okay. snake he's worried about. <laughs> it's the black there's, a, there's a snake on board somewhere. Oh, don't, don't say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Busy season in uh, ship repair right now is uh, we got multiple projects with the Barnstable and the Aquina down in Alabama. We just uh, got the Martha's Vineyard return from Dame Shipyard and the Sanctity is on dock there as well with the Island Home and the INO going on on the first of, right after the first of the year. So, and we go through, here's a, this is a picture, a drone picture of the two vessels as they stand in. At uh, an Alabama shipyard, the barn school and the Aquina, respectively. Next slide, please. Um, this, we decided to drop the rudders. We found some corrosion at the very top of the liner. You can, I know it's hard to see there, but you can see that rusted area there go up the stymling, and we're going to disassemble them. And uh, the rest of the rudder is in really good shape, just some minor maintenance on the rudders. Next slide. Um, we took the rudders down and we found some corrosion on the leading edges and we're going to be building those up. Uh, this is normal maintenance and repair and get the uh, rudders coated before reinstallation. Next slide. So the, the project right now is at 13.7 million per vessel. We have 280,734 in change orders total for Quinta and 354. 354,007 for the Barnstable. So the grand total for both projects were 28,045,057. And included in those change orders were the, uh, last month when we uh, presented to the board the uh, and the board council on uh, the differences in the lengths, uh, the cuts, and which the board did approve, uh, but we're we still we anticipate that there'll be a, a, a credit, uh, but the paperwork just hasn't been done for that yet. So, 
So we're at a new part of the project is we're cutting the uh, the mid bodies, the 24 foot mid body out. We have on the Barnstable, the exterior ring cut for, at uh, just north of uh, four to frame 44 is complete. And the uh, current project status is we expect the cutting to be complete in two weeks. And uh, the, then we'll be taking out the 24 foot mid body. And the anticipation is in six weeks, we're bringing the two back. We'll be bringing in the, uh, if you remember when we brought the vessels out of the water, we had these uh, these uh, self-propelled motor transports. We'll be then taking the bow area and bringing it back. Um, so right now, I, I think we're, uh, as long as they hold the schedule, I think we'll be in and get that done prior to uh, New Year's. So I think going into next year would be where we want to be in this project. What did we anticipate from coming online after training and everything else? So um, I think the schedule calls for uh, delivery of the vessels in April. Uh, we'd be bringing them up. Um, part of the training will be on, the, on that voyage up. And then um, the training that uh, we do uh, with the other crews uh, on site. Um, we look back to see in terms of like how much training we had provide for the Woods Hole, the Island Home, and the INO. And um, typically it, it was about seven to 10 days worth of training that we provided. So um, we'll be looking at something similar to that uh, for, for these folks. So what, June, July? The, 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 the goal is to have them at, at least the Bonstable up and operational in time for the summer season. And the, the equipment will follow the Bonstable by about three weeks. Uh, so the way that they're the way that they're doing it from um, that they lead with the barnstable and then uh, do the same work on the equipment. So that's why you'll see that some of those change orders are a little bit more on the barnstable because they're a little bit ahead of where um, you know the equipment is. So. And the training on one boat would be the same as the training would be. Yeah, so it's also yeah, yeah, that's the goal. Okay. <laughs> bring in the uh, captains and the chiefs for the two respected vessels down after the first of the year to start commencing writing the operation manuals. And we have a lot of changes from the uh, vessels that originally <laughs> to where they're going to be. You know, uh, you know, passenger age boats for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. What are the? Uh, hey, Mark. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, what are the plans for the vessels that are being replaced? Well, that's uh, we. Well, I think you might want. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, the, 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 yeah. That's a yeah. So <laughs> the plan. The plan for right now is, um, you know, just get to the point where we. We're comfortable with an uh, anticipated delivery date. And at that point, we'd be coming back to the board uh, with a recommendation to uh, declare um, one, two, or three of them as being uh, surplus and start to advertise, um, you know, to see if there's a mark, if there's anyone out there that is looking for a, a, a well-preserved uh, um, uh, asset. So um, the... Um, but we won't be in that position until probably um, you know February uh, February March uh, before we want to make that want to make that call. So yeah. just a wild idea, but is there a model where the one of those vessels could be part of a New Bedford to Martha's Vineyard freight solution? Uh, that may that may be one of the uh, opportunities for these vessels. Um, you know, the question becomes is uh, we, just, we want to do an evaluation with uh, three vessels. Do we want to keep uh, those three vessels? Do we want to keep one of them as a spare spare? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we uh, where we didn't go ahead with the, uh, the fourth um, sister uh, to these other ones. Uh, do we want to have a, a vessel that um, we have? And so we had to come up with a, you know, what the cost of keeping you know, for instance, the sanctity around what what's that going to cost us uh, long term uh, to to be keeping that as an insurance policy? So, yeah, I mean that model worked with the governor, obviously. It it, it did, and um, the, the the issue being is that now with these vessels being you know a little bit um, you know a little bit bigger than the other the vessels they're replacing, uh, you know it's going to be you know 
difficult to be uh, uh, you know, making a swap because there will be the vehicle capacity will be lower. But yeah. um, I think we're you know the discussions we've we're having internally here is that you know we do we do see a benefit to to having a spare um, you know for the, just you know in the event that something happens. So, but again, we need to. Uh, clarify what those costs would be and uh, you know make that recommendation one way or the other. Any other questions? Yeah, you know, Mr. Chairman, just want to ask Mark A about spare parts and some of the other stuff, just clarifying a few things with, with these vessels and what we're getting. You know, you've had time now down there and know what's going on. So I'm just curious, are we getting what are we getting with these boats besides what's on them now? I remember something about spare parts and generators and things like that. Yeah, we're going through right now as part of our cat and be included in the capital budget, what we're going to need for operations. It's going to be a multi-year thing for us to build up the, uh, the uh, spare parts inventory the way we would like. Um, the when we bought the ships, as you remember, we did not get any shore based spares with these, so we're in the middle of an identification right now of critical spares that we need for a year one operation, and then we'll start. It'll be a multi year operation, um, multi years till we get these to the exact area that we want them as regards to shore based spares and critical spares because that's important and it does take time. And to do that, and things that we have for our other boats, people don't realize how fortunate we are to have a lot of things. Boats have the same engines and turbochargers and all these other things that make it easier to fix things. So, you know, I just thought I'd ask that. And then um, with Bob's point about the Sankity, the Sankity is easy to load in comparison to the Gay Head and the Katama because it doesn't have a house and it has pasture capacity, but yes, it is smaller and that does make a problem. But then when, when Rob brought up the governor, the governor's a drive through and carries tons of cars. So it's a completely different, and plus the vineyard's falling in love with it. So that's another issue. So, <laughs> so we got that, that boat's gonna be a whole nother conversation, Mr. Chairman. So, but thank you very much, um, Mark, for everything you've done with this and um, seeing this through and hopefully everything comes out right for the spring. I'd just like to add that, you know, we have a lot of, uh, for instance, on the auxiliary generator part, we have the same engines on board the new OSVs, uh, the Barnesville and Quinter as we do the island home, same systems and steering systems as the island home. So it's, we have some of our spares to be somewhat um, consolidated fleet wise. Good. 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 Any other questions from the board? Thank you. Uh, the Martha's Vineyard uh, dry dock status, please. Sure. John, can you put up next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so the, the Martha's Vineyard uh, is uh, currently at Fairhaven Ship. I mean, Fairhaven maintenance, uh, we're just getting it ready to go back into service on the 16th, uh, but this is a, probably just a, a totalization of where we were at the end of the docking. So what you'll see is uh, this is the underwater area. She's all dressed up, uh, ready to go back into the water. Next. Again, this is just kind of an example of some shaft work that we do, uh, you know, and this is kind of what we deal with this is in the seal area of the cutlass bearing area of the of the shafts. You can see you get grooving in there, and we decided to remove the shafts. Although the tolerances were fine, just to bring them back down, get them built up and machined. But we'll identify that next slide, please. So this is a picture in the machine shop where they do the weld buildup and stress relieving of the uh, shaft. And next slide, please. So at the end, we uh, do the polishing and you'll see the red in there as we do our non-destructive examination for cracks, et cetera. And now she's ready for reinstallation. So this is pretty much, we're seeing a lot more with the vessels and hyenas. The sand is very aggressive and we're very proactive in 
getting these out early. Next slide, please. Just a picture, you can see these are the new cutlass bearings installed. That's the uh, port strut and port stern tube. Next, we just uh, finished doing a, uh, some, some uh, plan maintenance on overhaul of an auxiliary generator. Next. This is, uh, we did, uh, we have a white gill bow thruster. We did overhaul seal replacement, just general maintenance. Next. So the highlights of the docking, obviously hull coatings, uh, bow thruster overhauls, main propulsion cap repairs, bearing replacements, <clears throat> structural steel renewals, blasting coat of the hull and superstructure. Next slide. So for the Martha's Vineyard, our, our uh, budget was 1.24 million. We had 245,195 in change orders. So we came in under budget at 999,737. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Good stuff, Mark. I'm good. I'm good, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, going to uh, MV Sankety Dry Dog status, please. Okay, we're in the early days of the docking and the sanctity. We she's in there. We've finished our uh, structural steel review, and uh, we found we don't have any exterior steel renewal on the underwater or the or the above water line areas. Uh, next, again, uh, we're again real aggressive ones on sh on shaft removals. We've sent two of the shafts down for evaluation and repairs down to New Jersey. As you can see here, we're doing a lot of underwater coating areas. You can either do one or two things, coatings, you do steel, and it's preferential to do the coatings. Next, just a different view of the stern area of the, uh, of the sanctity. So uh, at this point, everything's blasted in the first coat of anti-corrosive. 300V has been installed. Next. So the uh, dry dock uh, highlights so far are hull coatings, main propulsion shaft repairs and bearing replacements on both shafts, structural steel renewals, which is very minor, and blasting coat of hull and superstructure. So the final for the total right now, we're at a, a our contract was 754,000. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any change orders or at this moment for a total of 732,000. Any questions? So I, I would like to add that um, Mark um, uh, showed me the preventative maintenance that we've been doing on these shafts and you know, with the, the practice that, uh, you know, since Mark has been overseeing the, the these projects, you know, in terms of getting the, the shafts pulled and inspected and all that. So um, yesterday, I uh, received word back from um, Skyline. You know, do you want to give the update on that? Yeah, we just we just found in our ND examination, we found a, a crack in the starboard shaft. It was, you know, these shafts are about eight and a half inches in diameter, and the crack protruded down to five inches. So we were probably at a point some time of failure on it, but i just like to point out it's collectively a company thing of you know, preventive maintenance and and due diligence and doing all the sh all shaft work. That shaft would have come apart at some point in the very near future. So we've got a spear shaft from the Shore Bay Spears, which is in transit down to New Jersey, and we'll swap that out and and move forward. Mr. Chairman, can I just ask Mark another question about yeah, this? Um, Mark, is this place in New Jersey? Um, a new place that we're using now, or is this a place that we've been using for a long time? Um, it's a place we've been using for a long time. There's, uh, they're very specific, uh, you know, to doing. Uh, matter of fact, our rudder stocks off the Aquina and off the Barnstable and then root up there. That's where we'll do the rudder stock repairs. They do, uh, they do good work there. That's awesome. I love it. That's, I just, 
I know that you're looking at this more because of some of the issues that have happened with vessels that all of a sudden there's a shaft issue and, and the sand issue in Hyannis being, you know, looked at as, as a possibility of part of the problem. But this is good. This is good stuff for public to know that these things are looked at diligently by the same vendor, which is important. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Any other questions? Thanks, Mark. All right, thank you, Mark. Going to be uh, training and development fair update. Okay, I'll ask Bridget Sullivan to come up. Um, give some highlights from our uh, training and development uh, fair that took place the past two weeks. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Today, on behalf of our team, as Bob mentioned, I'll be providing a brief summary regarding our recent training and development fair, formerly the safety fair. Next slide, please. Over the course of the last two weeks, the authority hosted its third training fair. During the course of the fair, as you can see presented on the screen, we hosted a variety of training options from safety specific like OSHA 10 Maritime to professional training like customer service, all of which were instructor led trainings. Instructors were either outsourced or internal. Overall, we had over 100 participants resulting in approximately 617 trainings completed. Next slide, please. And during the course of the fair, we hosted trainings at many of our different locations to increase our participants' availability. For example, trainings took place at Fairhaven Vessel Repair, Forklift, Aerial Boom, INS and Woods Hole Terminal, Willowsville Trainings, CPR at Nashby Reservations, and many others at our administrative building. As you can see, we have our Director of Security, who is one of our internal traders. Next slide, please. And what is training and development without measured results? Multiple surveys were conducted to which our goal is to continuously improve our program for the years to come. Survey questions were both open-ended questions and yes or no questions. To date, I am able to provide a summary of 60 surveys returned so far. And I would like to share kudos to Sean and the ongoing website training as it has been well received and commented within the surveys as well. We have received an overwhelming positive response in general, and we've also received feedback regarding future training opportunities. So as you can see on the sample of survey questions, the top, question, the top question, other than the trainings provided, what other trainings would you like? We are actually encouraging our team members to reach out to us and tell us what trainings do they need or what would they like to see as we move forward with this program. Next slide, please. Over 90% of the results show that our employees found our TND fair valuable, 55% extremely valuable. I can confidently say that we're headed in the right direction, and we'll use this data to make improvements where we can in time for next uh, spring's training and development fair. Any questions? Yeah, is this mandatory? And how many people, percentage of the employees, uh, attended these? I don't have the percentage offhand, but I can certainly get that to you. It's both mandatory and voluntary. How is that? So, there's, there's, certain, there's certain elements, for instance, the aerial boom and the forklift training. Uh, those are all um, requirements for any of our people in, in, those, okay. in yeah. the yeah. vessel maintenance to, to be operating that equipment. Um, we also have the oil spill. That's you know the, the training to be able to put out the boom and things like that. That's that's something that we want. We need to make sure that we have people at each of our facilities that are trained on trained yeah. on that. So um, it, it varies by varies by uh, by training session. But thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I, I have one question. Sorry, I didn't see you. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you. Um, on the list of individual trainings, there's something called total set guardian. What what does that training involve? Total asset guardian. That's okay. related that's to good. our workforce. Did I spell it wrong? Yeah, it's a... I do apologize. <laughs> I'll be more careful next time. I'm sorry. So anyway, even with the spell, right? What what what's the training involved? That's so that uh, essentially what? captures our preventative maintenance in our our tag system. So how how they're able to put in work orders into the into the system and how they're able to track those work orders to to see when they're completed and things like that. So. Uh, that's what the uh, the the asset uh, the asset guardian uh, tag is uh, is our um, our maintenance tool that um, uh, that works with our accounting system as well. So, 
great. Thank you. Again, I just want to commend the staff for emphasizing this very important part of the operations and, and think it's going along great. So thank you. Yeah, any, so, any other questions? Well, and, and I'd like to point out this. So this is the training and development fair, but uh, you know, starting this week, we have um, a number of um, ordinary seamen that are uh, in training classes right now uh, for their to uh, get the qualifications uh, for their uh, AB ticket as well. So this is ongoing. We're, we're trying to take advantage of, of this time of year to, to be getting get people in into training <laughs> and to uh, um, build build up our training program. Thank you. Great. Going to uh, number C, uh, trip diversion cancellations. All right. So at last month's meeting, uh, Jim Salito had uh, requested a report on trip diversion. So uh, yeah, you got it. Uh, <laughs> so um, in 2023, uh, the total number, uh, we, we diverted a total of 275 trips from uh, Oak Plus into Vineyard Haven. Uh, Sean, you still there? Yeah, the screen. Did you have the report? Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't have it up. Give me a minute, but you keep going. Okay, um, and this represented a uh, over ten percent decrease versus twenty twenty two diversions. Um, the diversions that we had in twenty twenty three uh, was just slightly more than a nine year average when we take out twenty twenty. It's below when we include 2020, but uh, we had issues with the dock in 2020, so that's why um, more trips were diverted. Um, let's see. Wait for him to get get caught up here. Hey, hey Bob, can you just uh, what's the exact definition of diverted? Uh, where uh, the trip runs, but instead of it going into Vineyard Haven, uh, instead of it going into Oak Bluffs, it goes to Vineyard Haven instead. So um, it, it's something that um, you know it, it has a big impact on the um, both Oak Plus and Vineyard Haven in terms of the volume of traffic that's, that's coming and going. Um, it also has a big impact on our customers in terms of which terminal that they uh, report to for, for their trips. So um, so this shows uh, again this shows that the, the trips that end up being diverted 275. Um, through the season, through the season, um, I think we had 307 the prior year and 290 the prior year. So it's it's gone down over the last couple of years. Um, you'll see in 2016 we only had 156 trips, but I think those other ones are uh, uh, close to 300 in 2015 and uh, 14 as well. So. Um, it, it, it's something. Um, in the next slide, I think. Um, so it, it shows this shows the volume of trips that we have, and this is through October of each of, of each year. So, um, excuse me, it's um, it's the annual amounts, but for twenty twenty three, it includes the budgeted trips for November and December. Um, so um, we're running uh, essentially the same number of trips this year as we did last year. We had fewer trips being diverted, and when you start going back and looking at um, the number of trips, um, even with the diversions in 2023 and 2022, we're actually running more trips into Oak Plus than we did in 2014, 15, and 16. So uh, the schedule calls for more trips to be run run into Oak Plus uh, than it previously did. So um, obviously, we we understand the impact that it has, you know, for, on our riders in terms of where they're going to be going. But um, we need to make sure that we're we're operating that facility in a safe, safe manner, and if it's just if the the tides or the winds uh, aren't cooperating, we we need to divert. And I think if you go to the next slide, uh, we started looking at it on a per month basis as well, and you'll you'll see obviously in September is the is the peak month that uh, we generally uh, end up having diversions, and um, you know a lot of that is storm related. You know whether it's you know we're we're hitting the, the the peak period of hurricane season, or, or uh, um, you know, storms that come up the coasts, and so uh, um, you know, while, while we may not be uh, you know a, a direct impact, uh, those seas 
tend to um, mm -hmm. be hundreds of miles ahead of it too. So the swells and things like that. So, so just want to uh, be able to provide provide that data in terms of uh, you know not only on an annual basis and by trip by vessel, but also on a, on a monthly basis. Interesting. So we said we're talking about trips and cancellations, and I'm probably going to get to what happened last uh, Wednesday and Thursday since we're talking about mm -hmm. cancel cancellations. Just because I had a family member that waited for about three and a half hours to get on the get on the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the questions I have is, like with the um, Nantucket, one of the rollers went on the door. Yeah. How does that go up the chain of command? In other words. An able body seaman reports that to the engineer, the engineer to the captain, the captain to the port, uh, to the uh, port captains, yeah. to you. How does that get to the general public? Because one of one of the one of the problems that was my wife had that nobody had any information to tell her what was happening, and they were sitting there for a long period of time not knowing. Is there any way that we can get that communication to the public? Yeah. Because I think that's important. The same with diversions in Oak Bluffs. You know, trying to tell people that the boat is not coming into Oak Bluffs. What's the chain of command going up? Yeah. So again, um, in terms of that, you, know, you, you had a right that you know the uh, whoever was on on deck would be reporting that to the engineer, the engineer, and and the captain on board uh, the vessel. Uh, they then notify um, the port engineers and the port captains on, on those situations, and uh, that gets uh, disseminated between uh, some of the maintenance crews and things like that. In terms of um, in terms of the customers, um, you know that information goes from um, you know, from the vessel to to the dock, um, and obviously we we need to continue to try to have a better process to be able to get you know have have that word be be. Is there any way that it goes to you and it goes to Allison and then Allison, yeah. you know, the person that's handing out the ticket? One one of the things I was thinking about, and it, it just comes to mind, we have a communication system when they're driving down, they see something, put on an FM station. I know that during the pandemic, uh, the church that I go to, uh, they have people in the parking lot during mass, they could listen to it and they had a dedicated FM station. Yes. Is there any way that we could have an FM station? So we know I'm driving down, coming down the road and I either hear Alice or somebody from the office say, this boat has been diverted. We've got to try to get people on the next boat. So they know driving down, either if they're on the vineyard going to the boat or they're from Boston coming down to the boat, they'll know what's happening. Yeah, I, so, mean, I think it's a simple thing to do. Yeah. I don't know. I should say so. Uh, well, we do have, we have an AM station, not okay. an FM either, station. Either, uh, okay, either one. 1610. Yeah. Um, and um, it, there's a, uh, a, 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 a version that operates for this route. As you uh, cross over the bridge, there's a, a sign that uh, indicates that. Yeah, I know, yeah. uh, and there's also one on the Hyannis route. Um, Predominantly, those are um, we can switch the messages, but it's it's kind of a, a pre-canned message in terms of you know we're parking now at this lot and, and things like that. So we can look at um, you know, whether there's any opportunities there to be able to do it. Uh, we do have a variable message sign, um, a fixed sign on uh, 28 as you as you come in. We use that primarily for um, for, park, for park, parking information. Um, and there have been uh, times, I believe, that you know we put up when there's a storm and we're we're closed. That we put up, you know, trips canceled uh, yeah. messages. We we have a little bit more flexibility in what that message can be on that on that side. You just put messages on, you know. Yeah, I mean, it takes a little bit. Not it's not cumbersome, but basically the parking lot has access to that program. So I would have to see yeah. what the availability is to have one on one. So personally, the, you know, to do the, things on it. the only reason I know from my own experience at, at the courthouse is that for jury duty, I could put it on any time that I wanted to. You know, I just pick up the phone, I change the message. Right. You know, and if you could change it every 15 to 20 minutes, I know it may be a pain in the neck, but for the traveling public, no, it, 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 yeah. it's important. I don't know if that's something we can look into. Yeah. Because I mean, right now, I know we had dock workers going up and down the line talking about the cars, but sometimes you miss people. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. But is it so when you get the message, does Allison then get the message? Yeah, so usually, usually there's a, a you know a, a text stream that, that comes and you know and include you know not only myself and Allison, but Mark and Mark and Mark and Charlie and there's probably another Mark in here somewhere. 
I know, I know, because we, we we do get the phone calls. I got phone calls on Thursday again when the when the uh, our island home was at home. There was a couple of people who had medical appointments and they were kind of nervous about getting 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 them. Yeah. So so that particular day, uh, one of the things that we were doing is that we had had a scheduled maintenance on the island home to try to, uh, to look at the engines and the, the, the performance on the engines um, well, for that. And then um, we had the roller on the on the stern door of the of the Nantucket. And then because the door was not operational, uh, you had to back uh, the cars on or off the boat, which caused delays and they got, they ended up being behind. Uh, we were uh, ultimately able to get the door secured in enough position so that way we can, uh, where it's the stern door, um, you know, the Coast Guard allowed us to uh, continue to operate it with the, with the, the door in the open position, so. Um, Those of us that are a little older remember back in when the world was allowed to notch that. Yeah. <laughs> so. Any questions for the board on this? No. Uh, thank you. Uh, reservation timeline. Okay. Um, oh, uh, but just may on that uh, uh, previous item, uh, we also included the um, you know the last five years of uh, uh, trip traffic to, to show, and um, you know in terms of the, the cancellations, uh, you know they, they they tend to be um, you know. If anything, the they, they, mechanical cancellations uh, have, have been coming down over the last few years, in which, um, you know, whether it's a testament to or some of the changes we've been making in terms of the uh, uh, the safety quality management system and uh, the preventative maintenance that we've been doing as well. So, uh, on, the, on the trip diversions, the captain is the one that makes that decision, the final, uh, uh, the final decision. The, the captain makes the decision, but they get input from the, the terminal manager. So, the terminal manager. Is aware of you know, what the conditions are there, and they'll they'll advise the captain that you know you got swells of this, you got, and and then uh, the the vessels have the uh, uh, the wind directions and speeds. All right, thank you. Uh, going to uh, reservation timeline. Yeah. So uh, on this one, we're still working out a few things on it. Um, that. Um, with the new website coming in, um, we're, uh, we'd hope to have a, a final decision, but we want to we want to uh, uh, take the opportunity to see how the beta uh, site is working on the uh, on the reservation system. So, because um, that may influence the uh, the opening dates for um, some reservations uh, potentially, um, and so uh, we'd like to uh, defer that piece of the uh, discussion until. Uh, um, at least a board meeting. Um, there are a couple things, however, that we'll, that we looked at that we we're, able, we're going to be able to do, and I'd like, I would like to point those out. So when we're over at Nantucket uh, in September, um, one of the comments that we received during public comment had been regarding the uh, uh, ability or inability of island residents to be able to get reservations and head start before anyone else is able to do it. And so uh, we went back and looked at it, and there is um, of those reservations that are made during Head Start, um, the uh, uh, customers that are prefer that are uh, island preferred or island excursion program customers um, could make them as transferable um, up to um, up to three uh, reservations uh, during the uh, during the time period. Or, or they could be changing the, the name that the reservation is in. Mm -hmm. um, so once we started looking at that, we realized, okay, there, there is a significant amount of those that are happening during that time period. And I think that the whole intent of this program was to provide the, the island residents and uh, the opportunity to get this space beforehand for their own personal use. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've talked with the programmers, we're gonna be able to do it, where um, the, the goal would be that uh, perhaps the first two days that we open up for Head Start, that that would be for uh, island uh, excursion or island preferred, but they would be non-transferable. They could be not be made in anyone else's name. So it's it's solely for the intended you know the use of the islanders. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, we'd open it up, and they would be able to uh, you know the customer the, those people in those programs would be allowed to do their transferable or even additional mm -hmm. reservations. We did make the change. It used to be only five reservations uh, a year. We we changed that to, to be 10, 10. 10 per per name. So if it's a you know a, a 
two names on the account that could actually make up to, uh, up to 20 reservations. So they would be transfer those 20 reservations? Uh, not all, not all of them would be transferable. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so um, again, it's the, the transferable piece of it stays the same, but- the transfer would just be like three, three reservations? Three piece. reservations. So there'd be yeah. six yeah. again, yeah. so. And then, and the idea again is just so that way we 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 provide that opportunity for those island residents to be able to get this space before any other space is taken. So, how do you monitor that? Um, I come in. I've got three that I can do, but I wanted to give my buddy one of them or my yeah. So the the system, the, yeah, So the 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 way that the programming is is done on the site that it it won't allow uh, it won't allow them to be there's a a box that will be. Uh, uh, shaded out yeah. that they won't be able to click on to be able to trans to, to make it a transferable reservation okay. and the system does keep track of once the once that box is, that. is clicked yeah it, it recognizes that you've reached the limit so okay has anybody ever tried to sell these on ebay um i'm sure that they have they used to years ago there used to be a a a, a person who would be actively uh, uh purchasing reservations and reselling them yeah. uh, yeah. and then the so yeah. Thank you can camp out overnight at the airport. <laughs> yeah. So um, along those lines, we're, we're still we're, we're going to be putting out the uh, the Head Start qualifications form. So uh, since this is an even numbered year, uh, it'll be um, uh, for those that are, uh, excuse me, it's an odd numbered year right now. So those that profiles into an odd number, they'll be getting a, a requalification package uh, that they'll need to do before uh, the end of the year. Or, uh, or before um, we start opening up for Head Start in order to qualify for those programs. Um, we've had um, a little uptick in the number of uh, profiles that are uh, profiled for the excursion program. We're up to 14,224, I think, for somewhere in the area of 13,000 previously. Uh, uh -huh. So it has gone up by you know, not quite a thousand, but um, it, it, there was an uptick on, on those. Um, and again, to, to qualify for the excursion program, um, they uh, they must have a uh, island. They must be on the island's town street list that we get from each of the uh, town clerks. Yeah. Um, we, um, they must must have a copy of a valid driver's license that has an island address, and provide a copy of a valid vehicle registration with an island address as well. The the preferred program um, they, they need to have uh, you know, uh, examples of. Uh, to show that they have a, a residence on the island, uh, phone bills, water bills, mm -hmm. cable bills, uh, the like, um, as, as well as the vehicle registration uh, for that. So, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, also presenting um, the uh, reservation only periods um, that we that we have, and um, on the on the vineyard route. Um, those will uh, uh, will continue to, to do that in essentially the same same time period as we we've, we've done for the past couple of years, which includes uh, going into the fall. Uh, we had back in uh, uh, 2020 um, there was a uh, uh, uptick in um, uh, uh, reports of uh, uh, traffic uh, issues on Woods Hole Road, and we uh, we went to reservation only uh, in the fall, and that's been helpful. So. Um, we'll continue to we'll continue to do that. So, and uh, and again, um, the other thing, uh, while we have that reservation period, we do have uh, the blue line, um, which is available. So, um, the change that we made to that previously, um, it, it previously had been um, twelve cars a day. It's now a rolling twelve cars, provided that this space available on property to uh, be able to, uh, to to manage those spots. So. Um, we'll continue. We'll continue with that policy as well. So. Any questions from the board? None. Thank you. Going to the uh, vehicle allocation review. Okay, uh, Sean, can you put that up? Yeah. One second. Sorry. So this is something that uh, had been brought up at last month's meeting um, regarding the uh, you know, reality perception about the allocations. So uh, we'd already been looking at this and uh, doing a deep dive on some of the data that we have. And so uh, Mark and his team in the county um, you know, uh, uh, you know, spent a lot of time on, on, on pulling, this, uh, pulling some of this data together. So 
Uh, next. Um, so just as uh, some background information, um, you know, on the Vineyard route, uh, these are the vessels that, you know, typically have been operating during the summertime and what a standard allocation is. And then CEU is car equivalent units. So, um, you know, a, a three space truck is three car equivalent units uh, and type thing. So, um, and then the number of trips that we run uh, weekday. Um, so you'll see in the summertime, we have approximately 1400 spaces available on the, uh, each direction on the, uh, to and from the vineyard. Um, on the weekend, it's a little over 1,300 spaces. So next. Uh, then we start looking, uh, you know, have we seen an uptick in cancellations and same day reservations and, and whatever? And those have been fairly consistent over the, over the last three or four years, um, both for cancellations and reservations made. Um, we also were, you know, considering whether the length of the vehicles are getting any, any bigger. Uh, so um, that was part of the analysis that uh, accounting did, and it turns out that you know by and large it's the same size vehicles, uh, both for cars and for trucks, and the average ends up being within you know decimal points of, of, of for each year. So uh, next, so um, we started looking um, in particular at each vessel, and uh, the governor ends up being the, the vessel that. Um, as much as everyone loves it, including uh, staff, um, it's the most problematic in terms of what allocation it can, it, it, what vehicle allocation it can hold. And um, you know, when it's an all car boat, it could hold up to, you know, say, you know, 40 cars, 42 cars. Uh, when it's a truck, it could be as little as 28 spaces. So um, to be able to get that allocation right um, is, is the challenge that we have. Um, so when we looked at the last, you know, the, the last three years, you'll see that the average allocation ends up being going down slightly from 37 and a half to 35.1 uh, spaces per trip. So that's, uh, you know, two, two and a half spaces per trip that we're talking about and over six trips. Um, you know, we're talking about, you know, 15, 15 spaces, 18 spaces difference. Um, has for it has this trip, so which um, vehicles uh, cars can't book to um, are about this uh, about the same. Uh, however, the freight trips uh, you'll see that there's been a, a big uptick in the, the trips that are designated as freight. And for on those freight trips, automobiles cannot cannot book to those trips. But then come the day of sailing, um, depending upon the load and the drafts of the draft of the vessel. <laughs> you may or may not be able to take cars. And in 2023, during July and August, there's over 2,000 cars that we were able to accommodate on those trips that were marked as a freight boat, um, which was about seven and a half cars per trip. Um, and you start looking at that over the course of the day, you know, it, particularly if it happens earlier in the day, we end up with a domino effect going on. I will say that compared to 2022, um, you know, we were, we were over 3,100 cars that we, we took on those freight trips. So we, we did knock down the number of trips that are designated as freight, but I think we need to do a, uh, continue to do a better job in identifying those trips and, and making them available. Um, so uh, next. So he, he has shown in July and August that, you know, previously in 2021, it, it typically was the first trip or two of the day that was designated as freight. And then the rest of the day, it wasn't. But in 2022 and 2023, we started designating those later in the day trips. And you start to see how many cars that were end up, you know, taking on those trips uh, later in the day. So uh, next. And that's, uh, you know, the same thing. So, we'll, you know, we're looking at, you know, six, seven cars up to, you know, like 17 cars on average being able to take on some of these trips and granted that's late in the day. Um, but again, a lot of it has to do with the load that's on there, whether it's if it's a, a commercial truck that's on there that we know is going to have a lot of weight, then we need to be, uh, we, we tend to be a little bit more conservative in terms of opening up that space for, uh, for automobile booking because uh, we don't want to end up having, uh, having them left behind. Um, but there's other times which we can look at the look at the load and based on 
you know, historical knowledge to be able to say that, yeah, those, those trucks typically aren't, aren't that heavy, so therefore we, we won't be having that issue. So next. So uh, I think what we're, we're looking at is following when we do the bulks uh, for the season, we need to be going back and looking at what trucks ended up getting on on the governor in particular, and whether that freight designation still should apply, or whether it should, or whether it should be opened up to for customers, and to be making that adjustment not only after the bulk process, but also as we go forward during the year. And if those trips that are designated as freight, what we need to be doing is we need to be looking at this in, like on a ten-day rolling basis every day to determine whether based on the load that's on there now, is this something that we can open up for automobiles to be able to be able to book to it or, or not? So, and these, you know, when they're freight, they don't show up on the website. So it's a, it's a trip that doesn't show, it's not even available for, for a customer to select. So by being able to make, you know, to open it up and on a 10 day basis, it gives the people that want to pre-plan an opportunity to do so. Uh, so in addition to doing that next, uh, we want to be looking at developing what a set of protocols are going to be for when we when we when we take that designation off. Um, so that way, and then have that those protocols, you know, not only you know, for, you know, illustrated to anyone who would be looking at these allocations, whether, whether it's reservation supervisors or you know, um, you know, terminal managers or or. Um, you know, agents and um, you know, even uh, shore side operations. So, um, and then uh, once they're in the, in the list, when, uh, once they're live in the system, we want to be able to to check to see if the mix on, the, on those trips is appropriate. Um, there's times where it's actually beneficial to try to move some of the trucks onto one of the other boats because it helps to uh, helps with the draft issue and things like that. So, uh, next. So the other piece is that we're going to be working with MIS is going to be working on developing a dashboard. Uh, so that way there are um, the individuals that are monitoring this to be able to go in and have some visual uh, cues to be able to say, okay, this is a trip we need to perhaps do a little deeper dive into and look at what's on there and you know, what's the probability of it being a heavy load versus a light load and, and, and the like. So uh, be able to, uh, to, to look at that and the data is in our reservation system now um, and it, it's just a matter of uh, being able to take that and put that in a perhaps a more usable user-friendly um, experience for for our, you know, our staff here to be able to quick more quickly identify these, these as being a potential or to be opened up uh, and that'll include, you know, that when these trucks book, they, they provide us with what they they anticipate their weight to be. So we'll be able to have, you know, a, a identification in terms of uh, what sort of uh, weight they have. I mean, there's been times where we've designated the motor vessel Woods Hole, for instance, as a freight boat, and that boat's capable of carrying a million pounds of freight. We've we've never reached that point, so there's no really never a reason that that boat would remain as a freight boat, but um, you know, it's you know, part of it is that when we we switch from one schedule to the other, um, we tend to keep the same designations for those trips. It's it's the trip; it's not necessarily the vessel, but we need to look at it on a vessel on a vessel level as well to say, okay, you know, because it's this boat, then that's not going to be that is going to be an issue, or it's not going to be an issue. So, so those are those are the things that we're we're looking to do um, to uh, be addressing. Uh, the underutilization um, and availability of those spaces, and uh, we do recognize that um, you know as we, as we go forward, the, the importance of having making that space available as soon as possible for our customers, particularly those that move free plane. Um, so that's really, that's what we're going for. Any questions from the board? Yeah, thank you, and uh, great. Thank you for putting this together. Just for the general public, I just want to mention this was a result of questions that were coming from the island of. Arthur Vineyard about the perception of empty spaces um, or both those boats that were um, the, the vehicles, the boats were not full. Um, so I have a couple questions. Your presentation, which was really helpful, focused on the government. 
How does that relate to some of the other votes? Um, the governor is um, the, the most challenging, shall I say, because of, as I said, it can have it can have a draft. It, it could be reaching a point where there's a draft issue or a stability issue with only 28 spaces on it based on the trucks. So if they're heavy trucks, they're carrying you know stone or bark mulch or yeah. or municipal waste or whatever. Versus um, you know the island home doesn't have that issue. The, you know the the, the Montes Vineyard doesn't have that issue. We also have the same issue with some of the freight boats, for instance, the Sanctity. Where depending upon the load, sometimes when we when we put the allocations in for that boat, sometimes it's better if there's five trucks that want to book for it. Sometimes it's better to try to move that fifth truck over to the island home than it is to keep it on there because by having that, it ends up creating that draft issue that we have. So what does that mean that it goes? It, it goes too deep in the water. So deep. once it goes to it, once it hits a, a certain draft point on the vessel, it limits the number of passengers that can go on board. And so once we limit the passengers, we typically can't take the cars because we'll end up being over the passenger capacity. So they don't have to keep the weight evenly on both sides of the- Right, so like- Didn't the old boats have, wasn't there a boat that had a- They, they still do, the, the governor yeah, still has that. It yes. still has yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, and they have it in the wheelhouse. They have it in the wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah. The wheelhouse of the vessels have yeah, them. But I mean, yeah. So um, now the issue with the, um, we're, we're looking at this to be going away with the Aquina, Barnstable, and Monomoy, because these are going to be uh, those are going to be H boats. So we we don't anticipate based on the, the loads of what they're going to be able to carry us getting to the point where we hit any draft restrictions on those vessels. But it is something we we need to continue to deal with on, on the vessels that we have right now. Um, and as I said, the, the 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 variance on the governor. Can be so so much more dramatic than any of the other vessels, mm -hmm. and um, you know that's and part of it is that you know it's it's running into Vineyard Haven because it's too it, it it draws too much to be able to go into Oak Bluffs, so it's picking up all those heavier trucks that can't go into Oak Bluffs because it, it being on the wooden pier, I uh, have to go through Vineyard Haven, and so because of that, um, you know it ends up being a you know it compounds that issue as well. So, um, but it's something that uh, we're aware of and we're gonna, you know, we need to stay on top of, um, you know, and, uh, on a going forward basis. A couple more questions if I can come back here. Um, people on the island say that it's the freighters, customers that do not cancel. Um, and so those spaces become available late in the game. Well, I'm making this up. A freight carrier has 10 trucks for a, a nine o'clock boat. They don't bring 10 trucks, they're down to five. Mm -hmm. Or they might just blow off all 10. Yeah. Um, and they pay pay the price. What what can we do about that to make it easier? Yeah. Mark, do you have this question? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Well, no, no. So first of all, we have the penalties in place for the no-shows, and that's where if they cancel the day before, no penalty, and then we can they're supposed to do it before noon, and that's where the wake was to grab if you knew the day before. Yeah. Um, in addition to the penalty, we also have if you cancel more than 20% of your bulk reservations, you'll not be allowed to uh, participate in bulk purchase uh, reservations again next year. So there's an incentive to not cancel that many reservations. And keep in mind, these shippers are booking, you know, right now they're sending the request in on October, next October, a year in advance, trying to. Right. Forecast what their demand models are going to see. So see. there's a way to manage. Yes, and, and then and going, you're comfortable with that. Yeah, and okay. going back to the governor, the other issue is that it has a center house. It's a long center house. Yeah, where the contain the sank, and you can drop those truck trucks back. No more, no less. You're four wide. That's the most you can go wide. And the governor, when you start going around that house, yeah. you're taking two lanes sometimes, depending on the length of the truck. Yeah, where on the other freight boats you don't have that. So okay. that's another variable, not only is the draft in the uh, list, but you also have that truck to take two lanes up because of where it is compared to the house. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Any other questions? Just one last one. About this dashboard, could you go into that dashboard a little bit more about the features and functions and so, the delivery time on that? Yeah, um, so Alice and I spoke from Dr. Yeah. and what they, he would be able to do is look at the number of trips over that time period yeah. and then put up a graphical display for all your trips listed. And so if uh so to say 
trip to ten in November is 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 you know we can see that there's a space issue there. Yeah. You have say a red button or a yellow, so you know what's green, what's red, what what to go. Yeah. And uh, for me, I would you know that's that's step one. What you ultimately want to get to would be to have that automated at some point down the road. Um, as the system matures and, and that you know that report. So that to me would be a step one. Right. To to that process. I don't think we got a timeline on when that it's going to no, no. Yeah. the request the, 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 the request is there. Yeah. 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 Okay. You know, and the other issue when the trucks do cancel the day before that trip could have been overdrafted the day before. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now, say they're having a crash or not enough uh, goods were going or work something uh, supply chain affected them. Now that boat's not overcraft the next day. Okay. And then it's getting that notification to change that. So and that's it should good. be noted that it's really only one or two shippers that are notorious for last minute cancellations and whatnot. It's not the majority of the shippers because they can't afford to. Lose that much money. They yeah. can't afford to just suck up that much money into yeah. their bottom line. So, and there's been times where I've checked in the morning the next day, it's that draft, but come a few hours into the day, it's no longer at draft because things have moved ahead. Yeah. Things you can't, you know, it's just one of those things that it's it's almost a full time job to stay on these trips. Okay. On a daily okay. basis. So the other the other issue in terms of some of these truck cancellations is is when the the budget for 2024 was proposed and the rate adjustments it also included an adjustment to the cancellation policy on the trucks so that way um, they have to cancel by nine o'clock the day before uh, as opposed to six o'clock six a.m. Yeah. before um, and that gives them the opportunity to to get in to see what they what their load might be for the next day as mm -hmm. opposed to not knowing and not canceling. Okay. Um, so, and it also means that our truck coordinators will be available then uh, as well. So that way that they can be contacting them to say, yeah. okay, I got this, can I move it? Or, mm -hmm. you know, what's the... Yeah. And uh, one of those bigger shippers that have a habit of not canceling, when they probably should, have been in contact with us and they're trying to get that under control themselves. So. That hopefully we'll see a difference with that as well. And I'm not going to say we should. Good. Good. Any other questions? Yeah. Joe. Yeah, I, I got my little hand there. How you doing? <laughs> I haven't had one audible sigh come through. I don't believe today, so we should all be thankful. Um. All right. Let's 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 re restart this. This is the most important conversation that we can have and i can tell you this goes back to 30 years ago or more this is not new this is just more complex long before mark came up with the ceu term that we still laugh about to this day so bob already stole one question the new boats won't have the weight issue that needs to be understood by everybody that they're essentially as allison said the woods hole that you're going to be backing up on okay it's essentially that's what we have with these new boats okay so i've got a couple of points i want to separate the vineyard from nantucket here a little bit and have management chime in when so that they can explain what i'm saying in a better way we have standbys so gaps in the system whether they're natural space there's always space for something there's always going to be three or four car spaces regardless which is what we need for emergencies medical ambulances funeral home i mean i can name more but that's the stuff that happens but we can just leave our car and the car gets put on the next boat. The vineyard doesn't have that, okay? So when there's space on the vineyard trips, it's worse optically because there are people that could have technically booked those spaces in, in uh, let's just say for argument's sake, I'm not saying that the demand for that trip is always gonna be there. That's, that's the other part that management hasn't mentioned. There are trips that just aren't gonna have be full, no matter what. OK, so I want to talk about what would happen 
if we had overbooking, because that's one of the things that has come up in the past with these conversations that I've had with you guys before. I mean, no, when 90s in the early 2000s, we've talked about this. We don't want to overbook and have someone with a reservation that can't fit. However, that may be a better problem than having a football field on the boat. Okay. So that's something I think you guys should look at is the potential overbooking scenario on each route. The, on our route, it's a different issue. Somebody could be left there, give a free passenger ticket on the fast ferry or whatever. But on your route, you've got a zillion trips. It's probably not that big of a deal if it's overbooked one or two cars on occasion. The second thing is same day reservations. So what Bob just talked about, about the truck canceling stuff is really important. But at the same time, same day booking needs to be looked at so that on your route, John and Joe, you same day booking is almost like standby compared to us. Okay. The other thing, and this is something Allison and myself and Bob and Mark have looked at and talked about for a long time is the T3 issue. The T3 issue, you guys, I know you don't know what I'm talking about, but it's a 20 foot truck difference. All the other ones are 10 feet. I think we're going to have to look at T3. That's a very common size, but you can have a T3 35 feet or 54 feet, 11 inches. So that's an issue and as well as the T2 needs to be tweaked a little bit. Now, the opportunity that we have, and I'm going to bring back something else that Bob said earlier, is, and you just we just have to be patient here. I mean, it, it's hard to fix things, okay? People think it's easy. It's not, okay? When we have these new boats for a year, it's going to be a completely different operation because they're all the same. You're not going to have all these shifting around. Bob mentioned that earlier about the sanctity. When you guys have a breakdown with the Island home, I just, I don't even know what to say, what a mess that is over there because it holds so much. And then all of a sudden you're using teaspoons for, for a few days. It's, it's completely different. We have different problems similar when the Eagle goes out, we have the woods hole come in to offset the car equivalent spaces on the water for that day. But you guys have a different system over there. You're, you're an airplane that's booking with seats. We don't really have that here. So I think I'm really happy that this conversation has made it back to the forefront. Unfortunately, it comes with a lot of negativity towards the steamship and, and different things, which is un, un, unfortunate. But this conversation is vital and it will, by having these new vessels coming in, it's going to give us a better snapshot at fixing it because they're going to carry the same amount. It's not going to be, well, what boats on this schedule? Oh, we have to allocate this way. It's going to help us allocate more cars on certain trips and more trucks on other trips. So I'm really happy about that. But I'd like you guys to um, you know, explain what I said in a simple way. I know you can. I'm just trying to plug in a few things that aren't mentioned about, especially the T3 issue. Thank you, Joe, for uh, letting me have that. Anytime, Matt. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. So, um, well, in terms of that speak, um, <laughs> what he's referring to is that uh, because they have the standby, we have the driver services on the highest Nantucket route. Right. Um, you know, the residents are able to leave their cars or yeah. some of the shippers leave their trucks and we drive them on. So we're, we're always on that route. We're, we're able to maximize every load as much, you know, to provide if the vehicles there that we're, yeah. we're maximizing the load. The issue that we have on the vineyard run is, a, is different because um, we don't have the real estate to be able to stay, you know, to, yeah. to manage that. We don't have the personnel to be able to, you know, drive them on and off. The volume of trips that we have, you know, we're, we're talking in the summertime. There's nine trips a day um, on the on the Nantucket route, and there's you know 31 trips 
in, in, uh, down here. So the the, vo the volume is a lot different. So um, so that that's what we started with. Um, the issue uh, about the the T three is is it's something that we're we're very cognizant of that um, as we look at these bookings, um, you know, you could have. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, a shipper that has a forty-foot box truck, and that's booking the same amount of space as a tractor trailer that's fifty, you know, fifty-four feet eleven inches long. Right. And you know, when that shows up, you know, that fifteen feet, well, chances are we're going to be able to fill a car in in the space. You know, even though the cars are a little bit longer than that, but yeah. the, there's always an opportunity to try to do it. So it's to come up with the right balance of what those are and. This is something that we're, you know, the staff has talked about whether we're, we're able to, you know, whether it's under the current system or on a, on a new system to be able to, to, to create more distinct space requirements so we have a better understanding as to what end up being the load. And that's why right now, when you look at the, you look at the allocation, you may say, okay, well, this four, four space booked on this truck, uh, on this boat, but when you look at it, they could be all 40 foot long trucks. And so now all of a sudden that's four spaces, four additional spaces that we're, that we're able to accommodate on the day of sailing. So that's why, as I said, sometimes it takes a little deeper dive into this. And whether we, as we look at this in the dashboard, hopefully the dashboard also includes the overall vehicle length. So that way we get a sense as to what the, uh, what the combined lengths of all the vehicles are. So. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Thank you. I'm gonna go to the treasurer's report. Morning, everyone. John, put up the presentation. Yep. Yeah, sorry, one second. Oh, wait, we're on one. All right, too many. There we go. Apologies. Okay. Uh, we're going to do the business summary for the month of September. So for the month of September, uh, we saw all uh, categories of passengers down. Uh, not surprised based on the weather we experienced in the month of September. Um, looking at all the other carries, they were down with the exception of one that was uh, flat, but they were down compared to the rest of the year. Uh, the vineyard was down 6.1%. Uh, the Nantucket route combined was down 14.5%. And total passengers from both routes are combined down 8% or 25,561 passengers. Uh, bringing the year to date of us being down 0.2% uh, or 3,925 passengers for both routes combined. But yes, September. What, what do you think was down? Uh, we had a significant, we had almost doubled the quantity of rain and the rain dates. And most of the rain that fell in September was on the weekends. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So that's going to affect the passengers and the cars and the park. You know. That's what I, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it was, a, I, I saw in the news was 15 of 20 levels of weekends from yeah. July on the rain. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and it's not only actual rain, it's the forecast too. Right. Oh, yeah. Puts a damper. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, so looking at that, um, here's the monthly comparisons, uh, blues 2022 and the uh, oranges 2023 for the passengers. And so here's the passenger vehicles carried. Um, again, uh, we saw the month, uh, every category was down. We're down 9.6% on the vineyard route, 6.3% on the uh, Nantucket route combined. We're down 9.1% or 5,650 cab uh, vehicles. Um, year to date, we're down 1% for both routes combined. And on both islands, you can see the standard fare autos are down um, significantly, where the Vineyard Route were down 5.9% and the Nantucket Route were down 3.4%, while all the other categories are up for the passenger vehicles. And that's a rebalancing of the percentage of excursion versus cars. And actually, through October 21st, we have more excursion cars traveling as a percentage than we did pre COVID now. Prior, it was significantly less, now it's gone up. And that will tie in most likely with the uh, preferred amount of people qualifying for the excursion program that Bob talked about earlier. Um, here's the comparison by month. Uh, rate vehicles uh, were down for um, both routes combined, 4.3% of 375 vehicles. 
Um, year to date, we're up 2,077 vehicles to 2.8%. And these are one way, all the uh, traffic numbers I'm referencing are one way travel. Here's the monthly comparison for the freight. Um, here's the monthly um, traffic report showing all vehicles, what time of the day they're traveling. On this slide, we can see the um, weekday average for trucks where, again, um, no surprise, we see the trucks leaving Woods Hole in the morning and coming off the island in orange, where the Woods Hole trucks are in blue and the trucks part of the vineyard are in orange. And here's the, using the same scale, just for comparison purposes, um, here's the weekend truck traffic. You can see uh, significantly less um, corn in the end throughout the course of the day, but similar patterns. Cars parked, uh, similar to the passengers, both routes were uh, combined were down 10% in 2024 vehicles. Year to date, we're down 0.8% of 1,061 vehicles. Here's the monthly comparison. Trip summary um, on the vineyard route for the month of September, we had eight trips canceled for mechanical, 16 for weather, uh, 40 for traffic demand, um, where we just didn't need to operate the trip that we put on the schedule, and 11 for crewing purposes. On the Nantucket route for the month of September, we had 10 trips canceled for mechanical, 53 for weather, no, none for traffic, and 14 for crewing. Year to date, that brings us to 115 trips canceled for mechanical on both routes combined, 185 for weather, 202 for traffic, and 287 for crewing. Um, in purple underneath each, each category, um, that's the year to date percentage total for each of those subcategories of cancellations. So, and in the bottom uh, line of the slide is the 2022 year to date total. Um, so the mechanicals are pretty much on pace to where we were last year for both routes combined. Um, a little bit lower on the weather cancellations, and obviously in the crewing, we didn't have that issue last year. When did we add the column crew? Uh, this year. That's what I meant. Okay. So, uh, because we haven't needed it in the past, yeah. and before we were combining it um, in with traffic, and I forget who was the person who asked, um, one of the members yeah. asked me to separate it out, so we're doing it this year, yeah. and hopefully we won't have it last, next year. Right. And do you think it's getting better if you look at the timeline? Uh, the crewing is because we have less trips operating. Right, right, oh, right, right. Okay. So Thank for, you. So, for instance, on the Nantucket route, which is the majority of these crewing, yeah. that was the, I know, we double crewed it all come along as opposed to triple crewing it. Okay. So every every day uh, it was missing, you know, two trips, uh, you know, a round trip. So, um, you know, that's, that was uh, after Labor Day, we were able to triple crew that boat until mm -hmm. the middle of October. And then um, it's back to a double crew um, because uh, we're yeah. conversations with the uh, Highline and they, they were able to have that later trip. So um, that we didn't have to run. How it. does that affect the bottom line? I mean, that's a lot of passengers that are not carrying. You know, but Mark, but so we lost, we lost, we had the off, the lost revenue. But then some of those passengers going to eat and some may have went to Highline where there's only some the calculation. But then as an offset, we'd have crewing costs, benefit costs, and fuel costs. Mm -hmm. and so on the next slide is our financial snapshot. Um, operating revenue of 14221000 was lower than budget by 919000 Not uh, unexpected considering the traffic results we had this month. Um, other income of $907,000 was lower than budget by $567,000. And that's because of the timing of green income. We realized earlier this year um, that we're expecting September to grab there early in the year. And that's where you can see the other income for the year is higher than budget by almost $2.5 million for the year. So that's really just a timing issue for the month. Um, operating expenses of $11,095,000 was lower than budget by $270,000. Um, we have other income deductions um, up 108,000. And putting it together, we have a net operating income of 3,672,000, dollars which is lower than budget by $1.3 million this month. Um, ironically, last year, we're, last month, we're over budget by 1,303,000, or net even for uh, August, September is pretty ironic. Uh, but net operating income for the year, we're at 22,128,000, uh, which is then higher than budget by 7.6 million. 
uh, operating revenue in all categories with the exception of concessions and terminal revenue. Uh, we're down for the month to 918,000. Uh, year to date, our operating revenue as a result is down 686,000 uh, compared to budget, 0.6%. Um, adding in the other income, which is uh, driven by the grants and interest income. Interest income is a big driver in that number. Um, we're at $1.7 million above budget or 1.5% for the year. Um, here's a breakdown by month. Um, the month of September, in year to date, of where operating revenue comes from. Operating expenses for the month were down 270,000 versus budget. Uh, fuel for the month, um, we budgeted three dollars and uh, 85 cents. We came in at 383. Um, we had saved about 16,000 uh, dollars year to date on the fuel cost, which you can see in vessel operations. We're down 1.7 million dollars. Uh, we budgeted at 395, and it came so far, it's coming in at 337. Um, we didn't see as much of a realization in September because we saw that oil price for barrel was up over $90 and a month now it's come back down. So with that, our operating expenses are down $5.1 million, 5.2% for the year compared to budget. And on the next slide, we'll give the monthly breakdown and year to date for where our operating expenses come from. Uh, so this is for the first three weeks in October. Uh, total passengers are up 4,183 passengers at 2.2% combined for both routes. And that does put us uh, barely to the positive of 258 vehicles uh, compared to the year before. Passengers, passengers uh, compared to the year before. So basically flat. Mark, can I interrupt you? Sure. For a second. That you forgot to mention the 730 trip number again. Just so people understand that when they see the big minus. Yeah, so that, the best. Fair number that it's not years. really the fair a fair number to look at that this year. Yeah. So to Nat's point, as we mentioned earlier about that fifth, that crewing of the fifth trip in the Iano, yeah. and um, I don't have the number off the top of my head. There's a significant portion of that thirty-two thousand passengers for that Nantucket Bass every year to date because of the crewing. Right. And here's the uh, all vehicles combined for both routes. Um, so on the Vineyard route, we're um, down 2.1% or 766 vehicles. On the Nantucket route, we're down 3.2% uh, or 263 vehicles. And again, it's the uh, regular standard fare automobiles uh, offsetting the other categories. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Any questions from the board? Good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I see no questions. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go into any old and new business. Um, the only thing I have, uh, which would be under new, is um, just a reminder that on Saturday is Veterans Day. So the authority uh, for uh, a policy that was adopted uh, two years ago will be offering free uh, passenger trans transport for any uh, veterans. Mm -hmm. So they just go into the ticket office and they'll be given a, a ticket to. Uh, to travel on the boat for the day. So, any other old new business? Uh, just a couple of things that I want to report. I received a letter from uh, Bud Brill, the uh, <clears throat> Port Council member from Hyannis, and he's asked not to be reappointed. Uh, I know he's not here with us today, but I'd like to thank him for his service for the past uh, for the past two years. Uh, do you want any comment, uh, Nat? Whoa, I don't have one, but that's terrible about Bud. Well, from the letter that he sent, I guess he has a, a lot of activities going on. And he just felt that he wasn't giving this the, uh, the due uh, diligence that he should. And he's asked that somebody else be uh, appointed as of the 1st of January. He's an experienced, solid voice over there, though. Uh, he is. Uh, he's very, very, very helpful. Uh, will be missed. Uh, will be missed. Uh, the other thing I would like to bring up is that uh, John and I met with the uh, uh, two uh, Finance Committee Chairman from Oak Bluffs and from Tisbury, uh, with Mark Holcomb, who is the uh, aide to uh, Senator Sia, about the uh, embarkation fees. And we met for about an hour uh, uh, talking about them. And um, it's Bill 1781, and it's before that's still in committee, and it's probably not going to get reported out. Uh, maybe until the end of the summer. And if it gets in the budget, it's probably going to be in the budget for uh, for the state, which means it wouldn't go into effect if it is in the budget uh, until uh, 
uh, next fiscal year. One of the things we would like to do, and this is what I would like to ask the court counsel from each one of the towns, is if we can contact uh, the chairperson of your finance committee, and maybe we could have a joint meeting, uh, Zooming, maybe sometime in January or February. Uh, I know we don't have anybody here from, uh, from uh, excuse me, uh, from Hyannis on here now, but uh, Nat, would you be willing to do that? Um, no contact me, your, your finance chairman. Yeah, I will. We have you mean our finance committee chair? Yeah, the finance committee chair. Yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. I know her, I got her in my phone. Okay, and uh, you know, when Mark, we would welcome you uh, also just to, to uh, be in on that if you would like. I appreciate the invitation, but uh, it's, this pretty much doesn't affect very even, but thank you, anyways. Okay. Uh, yeah, Rob, too, oh, excuse me, Rob, you're on there too. I, I apologize. And I would, uh, I would. Can I just? So I don't mean to interrupt you, Rob. No, just go ahead. Following up with Joe. Yeah. The finance, the finance director for the town, is like you know the Mark Rosam of of Nantucket. Uh, he knows what's going on with every little detail. So what I'll do is I'll reach out to both Denise yeah. and and him on this. Okay, because it's a there could be, you know, sometimes it's better to have the person that's directly working for the town, to, uh, uh, something like this. Okay. And Rob? Yeah, it would just be, I think, helpful to articulate exactly the uh, the goals and the question we want to get answered. We'll be, yeah. we'll be in touch. Maybe probably, we're going to meet again in January, maybe sometime in February might be a good time to do this. Yep. Anything else for new and old business? Well, can I just add something to that whole conversation? I think what we're trying to do with four council members is get some excitement at each of your reports so that we can put the pressure on Julian Sears' office and up through the state to take some action this year, you know, calendar year 2024. Um, so we get this on the books so the revenue comes back into the towns because it could easily slip into 2025. Yeah. And we don't want that to happen. So in the conversations that we had was we could rally, you know, Nantucket, the two ports of Martha's Vineyard, Falmouth, Hyannis, and all get on a phone call with the appropriate people. Um, I think it's just the kind of noise that we need to make. Anything else? Thank you. Uh, will I go into public comment? Any questions? Um, see any public comment. Not seeing any? No. Okay. Uh, with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Nat Wall. Aye. John Cahill. Cahill, aye. Mark Reese. Aye. Rob Bernier. Aye. Joe Salito, aye. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Nice Thank you, staff.